All right. Call the meeting to order. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, June monthly meeting for the Fairfield Board of Finance. Would everybody please rise uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance? I'm going to ask Mr. DeWitt to lead us in the pledge tonight. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before we sit, is there anything about Lucy McDade who asked me? No. All right. Um, I'm going to ask for a moment of silence. We had an uh, unfortunate, unfortunately, we had another uh, death of a prominent person in our community. Um, this is Lucy McKinney, uh, the, the mother of the, our state senator, as well as the uh, wife of our former congressman, Stuart McKinney, uh, passed away within the last month. And we'd like to send our condolences to the McKinney family. Our thanks to them for all the hard work on the, uh, behalf of the citizens of Fairfield and our best wishes to uh, John and his siblings uh, during this difficult time. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, being it's June, we are in the heat of children's activities, children's end of year school activities that have taken some members away this evening, business commitments that have taken other members away this evening. And our vice chairman, uh, Mr. Jim Brown, is actually celebrating his uh, 25th wedding anniversary this evening. And he's exactly where he should be, which is not here. Um, so we wish them uh, many happy years more and we send the best wishes of the board to them. Nothing like a date night watching on Channel 79. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. They won't hit 26 if they're doing that. <laughs> All right, so uh, our agenda this evening is jam-packed though. Uh, no rest for the weary. We have several minutes to approve of our um, budget season. The minutes, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven minutes to approve from that. We have a, re a review of suspense accounts. Uh, we have our tax collector here this evening. We have to consider a resolution uh, from the Director of Public Works regarding a $275,000 small town economic assistance or STEEP grant um, to increase handicap accessibility at the marinas uh, and the Yi Yacht Yard. Uh, we have to review a request from the Chief Fiscal Officer for a transfer of $25,000 uh, from the IT contingency account to the Special Department Supplies account. We have to hear, consider, and act upon a request from the Chief Fiscal Officer to transfer $1,120,790 from contingency to various accounts. We have an attached schedule, and if I'm correct, these are mostly salary accounts. These are due to um, settlements of contracts. We have to uh, review a legal opinion related to the Board of Finance role in the tax assessment process, just so we make sure we're all comfortable with that. We have to hear, consider, and act upon a request from the Chief Fiscal Officer to transfer uh, $428,000 from uh, contingency to the Assessor's Fees and Professional Services account uh, related to uh, an assessment of revaluation and then any other communications. Um, any questions on the agenda this evening? I'm tired just hearing you talk about it. Yeah, it was long to get through. Um, I might move ahead number six and seven uh, in our agenda, if that's okay, with the pleasure of the board. Um, it's going to be a weighty conversation, and I know that at least one member uh, may have a conflict later this evening that I want to be um, cognizant of. So is there any problems with moving six and seven ahead on the agenda? No one? Okay, so I'll do that um, after, uh, after item number one. We'll do that, okay, and then we'll come back. So item number one is to approve the minutes. Um, can I put this before us? Do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. DeWitt, do I have a second? Mr. Becker, the item is before us for discussion. Yeah. I'm happy to vote for these as a package. Um, I wasn't present at two of these meetings, but it's reflected properly in those minutes that I was absent, so it 
You don't need to separate them for anyone else. I'm happy to vote for them all as a package. Thank you, Mrs. Alman, because that's exactly what I was going to ask. Does anybody else have an issue with voting on these as a package to the extent that it's noted that if you were absent? Seeing none, I'll call for a, a vote. All in favor of approving these minutes? Opposed? Abstentions? We're good. Thank you. And thank you, Mrs. Alman. Yes. For the future, um, as long as a member is accurately noted as being absent, they can vote for the minutes. They don't have to abstain. We could save ourselves time breaking these out all the time. Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much and noted. Um, I'm going to move ahead item number six now, uh, which is to discuss the legal opinion related to the Board of Finance role in the tax assessment uh, process. A uh, bit of background on this. During our budget deliberations, the discussion became uh, focused on the assessment process, the fact that we finished it in assessment process several years ago, which actually ended up being quite contentious for certain areas of town with a great degree of concern over the increases uh, in assessment value despite the economic conditions around the country. Um, there was a heavy tax review process. The Board of Assessment Appeals was very busy. Uh, we noted that during our budget process that there were a lot of adjustments to the uh, tax levels. And we also noted that in the charter there was vague reference to a role to be played by the Board of Finance uh, related to the tax assessment process. So we asked, number one, we threw funds into contingency, as I recall, correct, Mr. Mayor? related to the assessment process. And number two, we asked for clarification of our role in that process. We wanted to make sure that we were doing our fiduciary duty uh, to the taxpayers of the town. And we also have, uh, if I could speak on behalf of the board, a keen interest in making sure that our citizens feel that the assessment process is um, appropriate, fair, conducted transparently, and that they have the ability to review the documentation, review the ruling, and go before the appropriate town bodies. Uh, did I accurately portray that in everybody's opinion? So we asked specifically for this opinion from the town attorney who provided the opinion but was unable to attend tonight due to a scheduling conflict that he had. So I guess, Mr. Mayor, it's going to fall to you and the first selectman should he walk in uh, to discuss the opinion. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Ross. Great. Um, Anyone else? Is he going, Mr. <laughs> Ross, are you going to speak to the opinion or are you going to speak and, to? And, and basically, what we're going to do here is uh, talk a little bit about the process, what transpires uh, within the assessor's office. Um, how the process works, how the decisions are made, and uh, what uh, Mr. Uh, Ross sees as his duties and responsibilities, and then we'll take off from there. Okay. Mrs. Alvin, I had a question before we get started. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you made reference to a vague reference within the charter. Do we have a copy of the charter here this evening to be able to see that? Charter. Uh, language that the chair references is on the second page of it the is? memorandum in the handout. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And I'm actually trying to find that handout right now. Okay. Thank you. Let me take a look at the uh, Okay. Go right ahead, Mr. Ross. Yep. Okay. Um I'm going to draw attention to section 1262. Okay, That's which the Connecticut state statutes, not sure. the charter. Right. Section 1262 of the state statutes, which places a lot of the responsibility for the revaluation process uh, uh, on the office of the assessor. Um, it speaks of, again, I'm just uh, summarizing the opinion. Uh, it speaks of uh, the assessor designating um, the revaluation company, uh, a company certified in accordance with state laws. Um, 
And the assessor is the one who uh, makes the ultimate, or the office of the assessor, makes the ultimate decision of um, the vendor to be selected to help the assessor conduct a townwide revaluation. Um, the role of the Board of Finance, uh, as stated in the, the opinion, um, is to uh, provide a physical system, okay, an associated software, which is maintained in the assessor's office for the collection and the arrangement of data on the property. Um, the selection of the revaluation company, again, uh, although collaborative, uh, ultimately rests with the office of the assessor. Okay. What do other towns do? Okay. Are other towns' boards of finance involved with the assessment process, the assessment system at all? I've spoken with several of my colleagues in the area, and um, they are the ones who made the decisions uh, and make the decisions concerning the selection of a revaluation company. Um, I spoke with several of my colleagues over the last few days. Uh, the town of Westport uh, is going to be doing a revaluation in 2015, and the uh, town of Trumbull will also be doing a revaluation in 2015. Uh, and the assessors there will be making the selection of uh, the revaluation company. What's their interaction with the Board of Finance during that process? What's their? Interaction with the Board of Finance. Okay, Westport, um, the Board of Finance, um, after the revaluation company is selected, members of the Board of Finance, this is Westport now, members of the Board of Finance uh, have input uh, as far as the the progress and the process of the revaluation what does that mean they they have a committee so the board of finance in westport has a subcommittee they have a uh, several members of the board of finance in westport who uh, apparently again i didn't get too many of the details so i don't want to get into too much because i you know i want to have the facts um, but apparently some members of the board of finance uh, participate uh, during the revaluation uh, in regular meetings with the reval company, with the CFO, uh, with the assessor, anybody else who's involved in the reval process to um, give input uh, on the process of the revaluation. Okay, and that's all the detail you have on that interaction? That's all the detail you have? That's all I have right now, yeah. yeah. Mrs. Allen? I'd suggest contacting Westport, yeah. Thank you. Excuse me, is Perhaps do you, you don't have any further detail to know if that provision is set forth in their charter? No. No, this was an ad hoc. Uh, so we don't know how they determined to do it that way. Um, it's not per statute. We know that. No. So it would be by some local governance would be my next assumption. It, I believe and it was be an ad hoc. Uh, interesting information to have. Ad hoc gathering of uh, members of the board, again, after the process began. Uh, it was a collaborative process uh, where, where certain members of the board were designated to um, attend uh, progress meetings. Right. Uh, ask um, I mean, to the chair, mm -hmm. based on the legal opinion we have and our charter, and as I read Section D, I do understand it to refer to system, meaning the data system. And uh, in this day and age, that would be um, computerized data system. And, and while my experience is, is very dated and goes back oh, maybe more than one or two decades, um, I do have experience at another, in another municipality. And the Board of Finance's only role in assessment in that town was um, to fund the assessor's budget. Um, and, and none further than that. But it sounds to me what Westport may be doing and what any other town is doing um, is decided at the local level because we're all living by the same statute. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Mr. DeWitt. 
Thank you. So I'm I'm trying to recall what what our what our actual concerns were. I guess one of them was, did we have any role in the selection of the company, right? Mm -hmm. And I find I find it funny that there's nothing in the actual our charter that talks about the evaluation. They had to go to the state. There's there's one line item under the assessment system under the Board of Finance. Right. No, I'm saying, but the reevaluation process is governed by CGS. That is not our charter. That's government. That's the right. Connecticut government, That's right? So, it's it's funny that we had to go back to that, or or Stanton had to go back to that to find it. Um, but in the as Mrs. Albin just said, in the procurement of that service. We are involved because we could actually just not give you the money. And actually, the um, purchasing department is also involved because they have to let an RFQ and, and I guess they have the ultimate, you know, they have to make sure that everyone's in compliance. So um, it, it, it feels a little, I don't want to use the word weak because I'm not an attorney, but it feels like there's other entities involved in this. But I guess what this is trying to say is that if it came right down to it and everyone else agreed, then the assessor is the final decision maker. 1262. Right. And again, uh, conversations with colleagues, they were the ones who selected uh, the revaluation company. Did, did we have any other, were there any other issues that we had? To, I'm just trying to recollect other than the. It was the whole administration. We wanted to make sure the administration of the revaluation process was appropriate. I'm going to go to Mrs. LeClaire, who has been involved with this from another town board and is also the longest serving member of our board, so may have some insights as to past practice. All right. My qu question with the town attorney's opinion and my reading of the charter is a little bit different. And I go back to the charter, and it's on, there's only a paragraph here for the assessment system. There's not one for the accounting system or the tax collection system. So to me, there's a purpose for this to be in here. And I'm looking at it as if it's a financial control. And it would be that there needs to be an independent board that looks at this process and says, yes, this is fair to everyone, both the town and to the taxpayers. And so my read of this is that we get to select a system and we should have input not on the selection of the vendor, but on the method that we choose on how we're going to revalue the property. Um, like whether we do a full valuation system, whether we do a market system, whether we do it every four years or every five years. That's the input I think that we're supposed to give in the beginning of the process. Okay. Um, I don't so much think we need to be involved afterwards once you select the vendor, then the Board of Assessment Appeals, and you have a job to do. Um, but I think our position is that we should be involved before that. <laughs> and I don't know. <laughs> Mr. I'm going to go to Mr. Mayor first. Thank you, Mrs. LeClaire. A um, couple of comments. One, I think that the state statute is pretty clear that the assessor is the person who, he, the assessor is not has to use the revaluation of another company. The assessor could actually do this within his or her department if the assessor had the resources and the manpower uh, to do so. But if the assessor chooses to designate a revaluation, to designate a revaluation company to help, the, I think the charter is pretty clear that he has the authority and the responsibility to select that company. Now, with that said, however, a couple of comments. One, uh, this, for those who are not aware, the assessor's office reports to my office. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and well, uh, I'm well, he, sh he should be. <laughs> um, Something rolls down. The there, there is, uh, the, and, and the assessor is certified. The assessor has policies, procedures, guidelines that he goes <coughs> by, that all the towns go by. The methodologies of assessing property are based upon state statute, based upon court law, are based upon a multiplicity of things, which is certainly outside, I think, the venue or, or proprietary uh, responsibility of the Board of Finance 
to think about and evaluate. The assessor is basically fulfilling requirements based upon the rules, the guidelines as set forth in state statutes and, and court uh, law. And, and, uh, and now with that said, however, there is a process where if you're going to pick a reval company, you send an RFQ out. Uh, Bless you. In, in my mind, I, I would have absolutely no, and had I known that there was an interest on the Board of Finance uh, to be involved in this, I would have no uh, problem with a member of the Board of Finance sitting in uh, on the evaluation of those RFPs. I mean, uh, none whatsoever. Secondly, if when we go to the next um, um, agenda item, which is to determine uh, whether or not the board chooses to uh, transfer money out of contingency and how much money to transfer out of contingency, one of the handouts uh, for item number seven is a proposed revaluation project public relations schedule. And one of the items in that schedule, and, and this is once we actually finally get going, this schedule will be beefed up. It will be flushed out. It will be much more uh, comprehensive than what you see here. But one of the items there, I think it's like the fourth item or fifth item down, talks about meeting with civic and neighborhood groups and discussing the steps to revaluation, education, and all that type of thing. And, and I, I, again, as the responsible party administratively for the Board of Assessment, uh, excuse me, not for the Board of Assessment, but for the Assessor's Office, have absolutely no problem with uh, the Board of Finance being involved there, uh, having, you know, having a committee, you know, however the, the you guys choose. Um, you know, finally, um, when it comes down to whether it's a full or a partial, uh, I, I think the Board definitely has the final hammer because it becomes a financing issue. It costs more money to have a full than it costs to have a partial. So in the end result, the board does have the final say. And, and that final say will be uh, you know, determined when the next agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mrs. LeClerc, since that was I off of your and now I'm going to Mrs. Albin. Well, can Go I ahead. Just yes. But we were originally not going to have any kind of a say because it was in the budget and there was no full presentation that on that it. That is a recommended for selectman's budget. The Board of Finance has the ability to amend, adjust, add, subtract. Okay. We all set? Yeah. I'm going to go to Mrs. Alman. Um, so, Mr. Becker, did you have something? Yeah. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But, but it, was, um, it wasn't really going to come to us. I, I understand the recommended budget, but, but to Ms. LeClaire's point, the fact that there was no conversation really and it was sort of just dropped in like normal, I think in the past this sort of, this sort of worked out okay. It came through it, you know, every five years. It got dropped into two cycles. They split it. They did the partial. The problem is, is that this last time, the way, the way I see it is that that this last revaluation kind of shook a lot of people in this town at its core because as the way that they're taxed is based upon this. So at the core of everything that we do is what their houses and, and buildings and whatnot are, are, are valued at. So we spent a lot of time going through, A, the budget process. We do the quarterlies. We go through everything. Um, all the town boards flush out everything. and. It, it just it seems to me that this is at the heart of it all and um, so for, for me I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation now I'm glad it was put into contingency and we and we can do this and maybe we'll get through this process and moving forward you know five years from now things will go back to normal but because of what happened mm -hmm. I feel like there there has to be some some level of you know of, of higher involvement by the Board of Finance Personally, from what I'm hearing, certainly w what we're doing right now, um, I'm not sure that we need to be you know, involved at every single yeah, yes. stage all the way through, but you know, from, from now till the end of it. But, but certainly um, at, at this early point, and maybe some very basic monitoring or updating coming back, something like that, um, 
you know, and, and to me, the only time that we actually have any real teeth in the matter is probably right is tonight when it comes to whether or not we, we you know, we move forward in at one amount. Yeah, the, the fact that there was uh, uh, a certain amount of, of uh, people who were disgruntled with the prior and, we, and there was an excessive amount of appeals compared to what would normally be expected does not have any impact on what the state statute is. Um, the state statute is a state statute. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right that the fact that there is some concern about what happened last time is why you're interested. Past practice, the Board of Finance has had no involvement other than, as I understand it, other than voting during the budget process. And what the, the town did this year was pretty much the same as I understand has always happened in the past. Put a number in the budget, the Board of Finance deliberates, makes a decision, approves or disapproves the number, or changes adjusted up or down. And, uh, and, and I understand all that. The, the point, however, is, and, and the point I will agree with you, Mr. Becker, is there is concern uh, because of the, the number of appeals uh, in, the, in uh, the last reval, and, and that's all I'm saying is, <coughs> had I been aware that the Board of Finance was really interested, I would have invited you to look at the, the proposals with us. And what I'm saying now is, going forward, uh, from my perspective, whether it's a partial or a full, whatever you fund, you can have whatever participation you wish. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to go to Mrs. Alban. Uh, listening to some of the concerns that I'm hearing uh, and what Mr. Mayor has just noted, a full or a partial, I believe given that the funds were taken out of the assessor's budget request and put into contingency and we have to approve those funds be moved out of contingency to fund hiring the company to do this reval, uh, we do have that power and we have that responsibility as well because we do need to do the revaluation. And so the next decision that we'll make when we deal with the next agenda item is what type of a revaluation do we want to fund? Do we want something that may put us in the situation we were the last time and when people in this community were um, concerned and many upset with the information that was gathered about their home and or do we want to have a more extensive uh, revaluation which will cost us more? And so that's the power that we have to decide what type of revaluation will be funded. And that's what we'll do in the next agenda item. If I may, I'd like to ask the assessor, could you please take um, item D of the um, uh, town attorney's letter and what's also the language in the charter and could you explain to us what you know that language to mean and if you can speak into the microphone because your voice doesn't project okay this is item repeat again please. it's from the charter and assessment it's also and it's the second page of item D assessment system yes would you please explain what that is because okay. I think there's some misunderstanding as Very to what simply my understanding is an assessment system is providing the tools that are needed to carry out for me to carry out or for the office of the assessor to carry out the provisions of section 1262 um, very basically it means um, the means by which the assessor can carry out policies, procedures, and standards um, that are used statewide. Physical tools? I mean, are we talking about, as it sounds, a computer system? Are that we is talking? a tool. That's one of the tools. That is a tool. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to go to Mr. DeWitt, and then I'm, I want to speak. I, th I think we've had this discussion before. The Board of Finance shall install and shall modernize from time to time a system. <coughs> I always thought the intent of that was if we had a tax, um, um, tax assessor who thought, as Mr. Mayor said before, 
listen, my office can handle it, 40,000 households, I got three guys, we'll do it on the, on the back of a notebook. <laughs> we, in our, we have the, the right and the, um, and the um, authority to say, you know what, I don't think the system you're using is accurate. I, I, I don't think, I, I know, I know I'm, I'm not saying that. I think that the system is, you know, the system is, is in place and it's, it's where it should be. Um, but I'm, where, I, where I'm losing it a little bit is uh, Mrs. Albin said there were people upset the last time based on what information was taken about their homes. I mean, I don't know the intimate details. But if that's true, I don't feel like I have enough details to even consider the next item because as far as I'm concerned, the, the, the person who knows the most about this is you. And we pay you to, to make sure that you mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. make sure there's an assessment in place that accurately assesses all the homes in, in, in our town. I want, I want to draw your attention to um, 2015 revaluation, full data verification, revaluation option justification. Mm. Yep. Very concisely, what I'm trying to say is a uniform and accurate revaluation requires correct, complete, and current property data, number one. Number two, Fairfield has not had a full data verification revaluation since 1993. That's number one. So what did we do last time? Partial. We yeah. did something called a limited data yeah collection okay. revaluation. So I got a little card in the mail Correct. that said how many buildings, how many this and that, and I checked accurately, checked Correct. in everything, and I sent it back, and no one ever showed up in my house to check if I have a shed in the back or not. Mm -hmm. So that's minimal amount of data. A limited data revaluation uh, is permitted by state law, mm -hmm. okay, um, if a person uh, returns the data mailer, okay, yep. no permits, um, then the uh, property is considered inspected, okay? If a person does not return the data mailer, all right, then uh, a physical inspection is, should be conducted um, to verify the information in the system. So in 1993, what happened? There wasn't a mailer, I'm 1993, guessing, 1993, right? it was what's called a full data collection revaluation, okay, which was uh, verification of exterior data and uh, verification of interior data. That was nice. So does that mean someone actually walked around and looked in people's yes. houses? Yes. Every house? Uh, well, there were, uh, in 1993, um, there were means by which they would measure the outside. If they couldn't get in, mm -hmm. then they would send a follow up letter, please, let's make an appointment person would make an appointment and then they would follow up and do an interior inspection. That was 93. Okay. 2001 was the first data mailer revaluation Fairfield had. Okay. Um, 2001 was the first data mailer revaluation Fairfield had. It was considered to be a full, a limited data revaluation. It passed uh, state standards. But again, data mailers were used in gathering interior information. If there were no data mailers returned, then the, uh, the property was visited for a physical inspection. Okay. So 2001 was the first uh, limited data revaluation Fairfield did using data questionnaires or data mailers. Thank you. Okay, 2005. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to give you a brief history. I'm going to go through the very briefly. 2005 was what was called the valuation update. Okay, there were no data mailers uh, sent. Uh, there were building permit inspections, uh, but no data mailers sent. Valuations were simply updated. 2010 was the next uh, data mailer data questionnaire revaluation. Okay, that was also the last revaluation. Great. Thank you. So here's my read of it, <clears throat> um, if you'll allow me. Number one, Mr. Ross, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for walking us through things. And by no means 
do I think you should read into any question of our belief that you're going to do a fine job and are the most qualified person in the room to do the valuation job for the for the town and also in picking the company. In fact, picking the actual company to me is irrelevant um, to the discussion. Um, that said, I believe Mrs. LeClaire said it uh, quite well, in fact, almost perfectly, in regards to our role should be at the beginning of the process and helping in defining the objectives and what we're trying to achieve and how the revaluation should be uh, administered, full, partial, update, whatever it mm -hmm. may be, in consultation with you, mm -hmm. as well as in consultation with the CFO and the administration itself. That's the way I believe this should work. Uh, the legal opinion I have two problems with. <clears throat> Number one, uh, when it's quoting state statute, uh, the exact wording is an assessor may designate. Doesn't say the assessor does designate, says the assessor may designate. Number two, within that same paragraph, it says the provisions of any municipal charter that are not inconsistent with the requirements of this section uh, are basically to be followed. Uh, number two, the I think you actually said it well, and I think you were polite in your answer to the question when it relates to our assessment system and what that means in our state charter, in our town tar charter. To And again, I'll harken back to Mrs. LeClaire's comments. To assume that that relates just to hardware and software and not more broadly to the tools to do the job, to funding your office appropriately, to defining what the objectives are of the revaluation, and to give you the opportunity to do it well, to me is just silly. It's like saying that we need to give the tax collector tax collecting software, or we need to provide Mr. Uh, Mayor with an abacus to do the accounting. Um, I just think that it means a system, and a system doesn't necessarily mean hardware and software. It means, as you eloquently put, all the tools to do the job and the wherewithal to do the job, as well as the objectives and the standards to do the jobs. Now, the happy coincidence is I think the administration has reached the same conclusion that I have, which is given the contentious nature of the last assessment and the problems we had, that I would be in favor of funding a full valuation of the town to make sure that we have the faith of the taxpayers that they're being adequately assessed and that their value is appropriately apportioned. So I am inclined to vote for that. I would say we need a clarification of the charter. I would say that next time this comes around, we should have a more deliberative discussion earlier on in the process over whether we want a full, a partial, an update, or whatever, whatever the options are. But to me, until someone tells me otherwise, and this doesn't cut it, I think we do have a role to play in that decision. And that, that's the way I read the information that's presented to me. Mr. Mayor. Uh, this charter uh, paragraph was written in 1947. Yeah. Which was before computers, pretty much. Exactly. So to so, talk about hardware so, and software. So, so it, it was obviously uh, Mr. Ross's comments about the tools right. uh, being a broad spectrum of, uh, uh, of both intellectual and, and uh, and physical hardware is, is, is correct. And, and secondly is the... Um, right, so the, go back to your abacus. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and secondly, though, the RFP uh, did uh, request um, the responders to uh, respond to the uh, full range of possibilities so that we would, so we would have uh, that information available for uh, the selection process. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other questions, comments? I want to. I know, Mr. Becker, you had something. Mr. Brockfeld, you haven't had a chance, so please. Thank you. Well, no, I haven't asked for one, so no. yeah. Yeah. Um, I get. I guess it, as a sum up, um, I, I, you know, sometimes there's problems that need solutions. Sometimes there's solutions looking for problems. And I think you summed it up pretty well, Tom, but I mean, I think at the end of the day, our, our financial role drives our... I think that's a fair point. ...social role, if that's the right word I'm looking for, or, or operational role, I'm sorry. And, you know, to the extent that the ex assessor presents us with his proposal, uh, his office's proposal as to how best to do this, and I think everybody in this 
body and people who are involved in town government is aware that the previous method did not, you know, engender a lot of happiness and also, more importantly, engendered a lot of uh, um, uh, taxpayer complaints, which cost us a lot of time and money to resolve. So, in other words, I, I, I don't disagree with anything anybody's saying, but to the extent that we get a presentation asking us how they would like to do this, and to the extent it makes sense to us and we fund it, we've, we've played our role. I, I think that's very well said, and I think it, it's what Mrs. Albin said earlier. Yeah. What I, the only thing I would amend to that is yeah. that I don't think that should be part of the budget process. I think that should be before the budget process mm -hmm. and a separate discussion mm -hmm. relative to our role in the Charter, mm -hmm. saying, you know, six months before, here's what we're thinking. This is what we would like to propose during the budget process. Mm -hmm. What are the board's thoughts about that? How do we want to go about doing that? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to us and during the budget process, we know it's means. largely perfunctory right. as opposed to a discussion at that point in time. And if I may, and if I may uh, Mr. Brown came to us twice before two budget seasons because the first time he came, he said, I want the money. We said, listen, we're going to push it off another year. We had briefings before. For Mr. Brown, both times before the budget season going in, I specifically remember having them both. So, about methodology, about well, okay, he. So, Mr. Brown's, if I remember correctly, right, came to us and said, "I want to do this," Psst, and here's how much it's going to cost. There was never a discussion about what, because. Because he, because the he board told of finance didn't care at that point. I don't, I don't know if we didn't care, or or I think it we, we an had an expectation of, say, of what the funds through, were. Let's yeah. stop through yeah. past history. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Anybody else, Mr. Becker? Well, just it, it's more about the partial versus the full. Do you want to do that now, or are we going to wait till the next actual item, or we're going to do it we, over the next actual item? Right. I can. Is that okay, um, Mr. Becker? Yeah. That that's fine. All right. Um, we discussed this. Any other comments on the legal opinion? Comments from the public on the legal opinion? Seeing none, we're going to go to item number seven, which is item number three, uh, which is to hear, consider, and act upon a request from the Chief Fiscal Officer to transfer $428,000 from the contingency account to assessors' fees and professional services in the fiscal year 2015 budget. Do I have a, it's moved by Mrs. Albin. Do I have a second? Mr. Brockfeld, the item is now before us. I will turn it over to Mr. Ross and Mr. Mayor, and they can discuss it. Mr. Becker, you had a question, so why don't you ask it now just to make sure that they can answer it in their opening remarks. Yeah, no, it, it goes to one of the concerns, and I think this came up in a prior meeting, um, with the full, the participation rate, I, I believe, is very low. Um, so I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned. I just have some concerns with that. It sounds good sure. to go with the full, but if the participation rate is in the, let's say, the 20s, or I, I'd heard it was a pretty low number, I'm not really sure that that, it seems like then we're putting a lot of money out, and um, I, don't know, I, just, I, I have concerns in the area. Okay. So maybe you can kind of give a little bit, and, and we can go from there. But okay. you don't have to answer now if you want to just blend it into what your um, presentation yeah, is. Yeah, I so. will. Uh, the number I heard I uh, don't know where that particular number came from. I heard a number as low as 20 percent. I don't know where that number came from. Um, our last full data collection revaluation back in 1993 uh, had a participation rate uh, around uh, 60, 70 percent participation, meaning full, okay, inside and outside. Okay, 60, 70 percent, that was 1993. Now, let's address that issue with uh, interior data, all right? Uh, a full data collection revaluation is the gathering of data both exterior and interior, physically. If you cannot gain interior access, there is a requirement that the data questionnaire, data mailer, okay, follow up. We couldn't gain, first of all, we have to try to gain access through an appointment. If we still can't gain access, then the data mailer serves as the information basis for the interior information. So we're covered as far as the gathering of physical data on the outside 
the gathering of physical data on the inside. Okay, whereas with a limited data collection revaluation, um, if you get a data mailer back or data questionnaire back, okay, it's considered to fulfill the requirements of a physical inspection. And I think it was Mr. DeWitt who said, um, well, what about uh, the addition that went on the exterior uh, that isn't going to be responded to in the data questionnaire? Also, I want to speak to uh, some of the physical changes that have happened in this town. Um, Storm, Sa Storm Irene, Storm Sandy. Um, I don't know how else to put it other than it altered the landscape. Uh, in sections near the coast. And uh, I think this would be an appropriate time to do a full physical inspection type revaluation to make sure that we're accurately reflecting um, the uh, physical status of properties that were particularly impacted by these two natural disasters. Um, keeping in mind that we haven't done a full physical revaluation since 1993, number one. Number two, uh, auditing. Um, Mr. Mayor can speak more eloquently to the process of auditing than I can, but I can make an analogy here. Uh, this would be analogous to a data audit where your last uh, collection of data occurred, you know, physically in 1993. Um, this would be the equivalent of uh, a data audit where you would be verifying the accuracy of the data that you have in your system at this time. Um, I want to draw attention also to, again, the frequency with which some of these full physical data revaluations have been done. Let's talk about our own backyard. Let's talk about the towns of Westport and Trumbull. Okay, Westport did a full physical data revaluation in 2005. 2010, they did a limited data collection revaluation. 2015 will be their next revaluation. Uh, their bids are supposed to be coming in next week. Trumbull. Trumbull did a full data collection revaluation in 2005. Uh, 2010, they did a limited data collection revaluation. Uh, 2015, uh, their bids are going out. So I don't know what either one is going to do in 2015, but there's a pattern here. I also want to draw your attention to the three municipalities that are mentioned in the, uh, the full data verification revaluation option justification handout I gave. Um, we have, uh, for example, uh, Hartford County, uh, town of Manchester. Um, again, the regularity and the rhythm of doing full physical data revaluations. Um, they did Manchester, which is a town of about 18, 19,000 parcels. We're 21,600 parcels. Um, Manchester did full physical data collection revals in 2000 and 2011. It's in your, it's in the handout. It's in your notes. Um, and Manchester's 2006 reval was a limited data collection reval. Um, city of Danbury, larger than Fairfield. Um, again, they're in a rhythm of full physical and then limited data collection. Um, they did a full physical data collection reval in 2012, and in 2007 they did a limited data. Um, Town of Hamden, uh, full data collection in 2010, limited data 2004. So there is a rhythm of auditing the data. Okay, we uh, in Fairfield, I think, are a little outside of that rhythm of, of regular data audits. Mrs. Aubin, and then we'll go to Mr. DeWitt. <laughs> and Ms. LeClaire, and Mr. Brockville. Do you have, okay. I'm comfortable supporting this um, request and having moved the motion I am, but um, I would be very interested in seeing a full data collection this time, given how long it has been since we have really updated uh, the information on the physical dwellings in this town. Thank you, Ms. Selman. Mr. DeWitt? Okay. So 428, 420,000 is the full, just so I'm clear. Okay. That, again, let's be clear. Uh, the, full con the full contract. Again, let's make sure we're all on the same page here. Um, you're funding the first, approximately half the first of the full. Half. Yeah, I'm with right? you. Okay. Yeah, the the uh, proposals expired last week. We uh, have been in contact with all of the, uh, uh, through purchasing, all of the companies have all extended 
uh, the uh, the proposals for for a week. We anticipate you know finalizing, you know based upon the decision that's made here tonight, finalizing uh, our decision internally and and uh, through the negotiation process with with the people who responded. Okay. That allows us to start uh, this month and and complete the process in a reasonable time to do a comprehensive job without rushing through and without having to request an extension. All right. So my question slash comment is, so I'm a little confused because I, you said when we do a full data collection, mm -hmm. we go out to everyone and 60 to 70 percent, I think that was your that number. That was 1993. So 1993, 60 to 70 percent of the people said, Yep, come on in, no problem. 30 to 40 percent didn't respond for any one reason. We went back out with another letter, maybe 10 more percent came in. And then some amount just never responded or whatever. We sent them a card and got the card back. And okay, no data questionnaire in 1993. No data, okay. No. But I, I, I guess I, I struggle with the fact that it feels like the data questionnaire that we sent out, we did collect data. Correct. We collected a lot of data, I bet. It, I, 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 I'm, I'm struggling with what's the real benefit to the town to doing a full coming in everyone's house data collection. So, I mean, I got the card. I filled it in accurately. You're not going to see anything different than when I filled it out the last time. Do do we think I'm in the major the the minority here, and that there's you're going to find large discrepancies by having physical inspections? Did your data questionnaire that you received in 2010 ask uh, about uh, exterior physical features of your house? I think it did. I think it asked how many outbuildings were there. Have you done any um, renovation? Any permits pulled? That kind of stuff. I specifically remember. It was asking, you know, amount of outbuildings. Was it I verified? Know what an outbuilding was. was it verified? Um, I don't think anyone came to my house and verified it. Again, let's get back to the concept of audit. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the bottom line here. Trust uh, but verify. It's, it's a data Trust but audit. Oh, okay. It's a data audit. They're going to come out and check your outside of your house. If you don't let them on the inside, they're going to check the outside. Right. The the other thing that I guess um, I'm, look, I'm looking for the value proposition here, which is the big deal, right? So the data mailer last time might have saved us money, and maybe it cost us money in um, uh, uh, appeals, just sp speculating. Do we think a full data package is going to minimize the appeals? So is it is so? Is this bigger number going to manifest later to a smaller number at the other end? Is there any data from Westport and any of these other towns you you you, you Mr. Uh, Chair, if I may? Yeah, yes, this? please. You know, you know, this is not a purely financial decision. Hmm? I no, think I'm with you. I, I think that, and the administration thinks that we owe it to the residents of this town to do as fair, accurate, and complete evaluation as possible. And, and, and the way to do that is a full. Now, it may well, or may not save a little bit of money. It may or may not cost a little bit of money. It may or not save or cost a lot of money. We, we know the maximum is going to cost, and that's the difference in price between the partial and the full. We have no idea what the savings will be. We, have, we anticipate we'll have, fewer, we'll have a better result. We anticipate we'll have fewer appeals. Right. There's no way of knowing, but it is the only way to do the best job that we can possibly do for the residents of the town. So, so I'm with you, but I'm a resident of this town, and I felt like I was well served by the last one. So maybe I'm in the minority. I, I, I don't know. And there were 200 people who filed actions against the town who differed. Agree. Differed. Agree. Let's put it that way. And if we had some, yeah. so 250 out of how many? We had over 200 court cases. Well, we, we I that think was the court cases. Well, time out. I think the question still stands. I mean, I don't think anyone disagrees that they want an accurate count 
yeah. for the taxpayers. I don't think that's what Mr. DeWitt's question was. What his question was is we're about to spend $900,000 on an audit or a data audit. Right, right. Do we anticipate that it's going to save us in legal fees? I know there's Which no crystal the ball, okay, but the, the answer question. is you think it's going to be more accurate, so you think it'll save us in data. In a uniform and accurate revaluation requires correct, complete, and current mm -hmm. property data. Right. Does it give you a better stance when you have a, if you have a case? It's more likely. Okay. That was the, I mean, that's kind of it. Yeah. No, I'm, so the answer is maybe. <laughs> there's, there's a potential to save in the end in that there's not as much uh, I don't know what the word is. I guess there's less, there's more physical evidence to to back up the assessment than there was last time. More complete. Right. Even though if you filled out the card accurately, <laughs> that's that's where I'm struggling a little bit, but but I understand the concept. Mrs. LeClaire, you had a question, then I'll go to Mrs. Alvin. Um, my question related to the inspection process. And I guess now, more than it, back in 1993, we've got two earner households. So will the inspection process allow for people to make appointments so they can say, yes, I want an inspection. I want the, the assessor to come and inspect my house. Yes. Okay. Yes, and here's, here's how it's going to happen. People will go, knock on the door. Nobody's home. They'll leave a notice. They'll be asked to contact the company company will make an appointment to come out and do a full ter interior inspection. Okay. Um, and can I ask one other Please. question? Please. Um, what are the statutory requirements? I know at one year it was 10-year revaluation, then they mm -hmm. changed it to the four or five-year. Um, is there anything by statute that requires a full, full um, data collection versus... Okay. That's a good question. Um, got it. We have to define first of all what constitutes a full data collection revaluation. Okay. Okay. A full revaluation is a revaluation where data is collected in some way, shape, or form. Okay. That's a full data collection revaluation. Um, it can be done either via questionnaire and/or physical inspection. Okay. There is. The second type of revaluation, which is just uh, what's called a statistical up, well, that's not even an accurate term. They don't even use that term anymore. But in the old days, they used to call it a statistical update, where uh, they would analyze the market um, and just using the data that was in place at the time, uh, update the values. Now, state law says that you have to revalue every five years, and you have to do a, a full data revaluation once every 10. So you would do, let's say, a full data uh, year A. Okay, five years later, you could do, legally, you could do what's called, and again, I'm using the wrong term, statistical update. Okay, and then C, you would do, uh, again, full data the next time around. Okay, so what was done in 2005 would have been what you're calling the statistical one? And what then was 2005 was statistical full? update, right. And 2010 was considered full. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Claire. We'll go to Mrs. Alvin. I think the first selectman has a couple of comments. Do you go want ahead. to make those now or, oh, oh, thank you. Given that the last full data collection was done 20 years ago, it's just too long a time span, um, in my opinion, to wait and to continue on without stopping and taking another full data collection. When people, when someone comes into the house, they will get information that, as I believed and I, we've had confirmed by the assessor, that um, will one help us with appeals because someone has physically seen it. And so there may be a house with a particular address that people make assumptions about and might think, oh, that's a big house, it's an expensive house, they must have all the bells and whistles. That house could have been sitting on that property for 50 years without any renovations and the bathrooms are old and a house in another part of town in the last reval went down and because of the system that was used, nobody knows that they have all the bells and whistles in the house. And 
So when they physically go in the house, they're going to know who's put the new kitchen in and who has the 1950s kitchen in that, that, that doesn't run up your assessment. So I would think the taxpayers of Fairfield would want this because I think, one, it will provide information that should at the end provide a fairer result to everyone in town. And I believe people fail, felt that the last revaluation didn't result in, in, in a fair outcome. And I don't know if it was a fair outcome or not because it's been 20 years since we've collected the kind of data that you need to really know what our properties are. And in that time, either <coughs> the assessments before 2010 were askew, we just don't know which of them was really askew. And I just think because of all of those possibilities, it's really time and critically important that we get the full information so that somebody in 2010 whose home value went down 20 percent um, in the reval and really should have only gone down 5 percent and some ones who went up 20 percent and should have only gone up 3 percent that those natural adjustments will be taking place during this process. I'm going to go to the first selectman and then I'll come back. Thank you. And, and just having sat here and kind of listened to the discussion, just a couple of observations. One is that um, to the point of is there kind of a guarantee to lower costs or lower appeals? No. But there is a probability that uh, two things happen. On one side, that the values are more accurate relative to other homes because we're really evaluating your home against somebody else's home in order to determine who the fair share of the tax bill that gets paid. Uh, and second, I think from a credibility standpoint, it gives uh, a certain more belief or validity to the homeowners that if somebody's come to your house, done the measurements, has the latest updated data, that you're going to feel more confident in the number that they come out with and, and in essence your share of the tax bill. Second, coming out of five years ago, there was a lot of concern, not only in, in terms of what was voiced here, and, and Mr. Becker, I remember some of your comments going back that far, given at the time you were representing Southport on the RTM. Um, but we also had the ability, uh, and I sat in on a number of meetings with taxpayers uh, who came to, to ask how it was done, why it was done, what took place, uh, and frankly weren't comfortable with the fact that it was done on a partial basis. And the commitment was made to make sure that we do everything we can to get the numbers right this time, but also to restore the faith of the taxpayers, of the residents, that we went to that trouble, that we did our best took every step we could to make sure that everybody was paying their fair share, not a penny more and not a penny less. Simply, this is the most that we can do. Um, when you look back at 20 years, I've heard some talk or comments about permits being pulled and that type of thing. When you go back already to 93, uh, we were not quite as um, consistent in getting permits pulled. If you remember the 90s, you remember Home Depot taking off. You'll remember a do-it-yourself boom taking place. Do-it-yourselfers didn't always permit yourself. They didn't always go down and pull the permits they need to. So a lot of the documentation on what took place, and certainly having worked as a realtor for 15 years, when you walk inside of houses, there were a lot of things that were updated uh, by the homeowners themselves during that time period or by contractors that didn't necessarily pull all the permits and paperwork so the town wouldn't necessarily have a record. That's a long period to go through, but also a lot of change that took place during that time. Um, so in looking at that, I think that uh, going back, looking at it, it's, it's been since 93. I think one of the things that happened at the RTM level when you, we talk about rumors as opposed to facts, Mr. Ross mentioned tonight that the you know, participation rate is closer to 60 to 70 percent. We also have, that was in 93 without the mailers. We have the uh, plan to use the mailers and do some other things as follow-up as part of this time. The rumor on the floor of the RTM at 2.30 a.m. in the morning when this came up for discussion was that there was less than uh, 25 percent participation rate. And the question, was that fair? 
So you've, you had a, a number of sleepy RTM members making decisions on information that wasn't quite accurate uh, at a time when they didn't have time to have a full discussion uh, in order to get the budget done by the 3.30 or 3.15 a.m. time that it actually ended. So I think this discussion is much healthier in terms of getting the facts out on the table. I think that we owe it to our residents to make sure that we do everything we can to get this right, especially given all the concerns from five years ago. Uh, I think there's a, a huge amount of concern in Southport in the beach area, and that was before Sandy and all the re reconstruction that's gone on. So I think we owe it to them to do the full data collection and do everything we can in that regard, both to get it accurate from a town standpoint, but also just to restore the faith of the residents in it that we've got a fair process here. Thank so you. Thank you. You don't have anything? I do have a question. Um, thank you for the data on how the other towns have done things. And, and my question is um, more about the expectations in terms of the credibility of the process, uh, the expectations of the citizens. What generally has been the outcome when a full review such as this has been done versus a partial that was done in the prior year. In other words, what can the part of the problem with the last revaluation was a whipsaw, right? People saw dramatic changes in the values of their properties. Some down, some up, right? Uh, I would imagine you heard from more of the people that had their properties go up than you did from people that had their properties go down. Uh, that said, are we going to have a similar whipsaw now going from a partial valuation to a full valuation? And I know you can't answer the question specifically, no. so I'm not asking that. I'm asking what have other towns seen in terms of changes in general when they've done this process versus the parcel? Do we know? I want to say... Um, I can't directly answer the question. Okay, let's get that out front right now. Those who have had um, the, the cities that I mentioned, okay, plus the two that are not on the handout, cities that I mentioned had a very positive experience with the physical data revaluation. What does a positive experience mean? Uh, accurate reflection of market value as of the date of revaluation. How do we know it was accurate based on what? Okay, let's talk about state statistical standards. Please. There are performance standards, what's called performance-based testing, mm -hmm. which the state requires to certify a revaluation. Um, every revaluation has to meet those state uh, statistical standards or the town uh, loses grant money. Talk to me like I'm in second grade, meaning define those standards for me. What does that mean? If you define the standards for like me. Like you just said, oh, you, you why, how does the state say, yeah, they were accurate? What is Okay, there, there's me? something called coefficient of dispersion. <laughs> um, That's not a second grade term, <laughs> but it'll work out. <laughs> but they have to meet, no, they have to meet, no, they have to meet something called coefficient of dispersion, price-related differential. Uh, and um, a median assessment at a certain level. Okay. okay. So, uh, again. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean, in other words, how do we know that it's accurate? Is it because the number of appeals that were brought and they were lost? Is it because there wasn't a number of appeals? Because basically what you're saying is, hey, the state looks at the reevaluation mm -hmm. and determines how accurate the reevaluation is. Statistically. Yeah. Statistically. Correct. Okay, statistically what? Yeah. Don, can you describe a little bit about what Tom Brown did last time? And I think it was the May time frame right before he signs off on this for the final time. Isn't there some testing that you do? Yeah, in that's, that was called performance-based testing. Okay. Okay. So, and just to, to frame it. it. Sounds more like second grade, right? It's, yeah, it's right. May 2011. Yep. All right. Our former assessor, Tom Brown, has to go through, review the final run. Mm-hmm do some sampling and testing, and sign off on that at that point. And what is he sampled and tested against? Again, it was median assessment to market value ratio. 
Okay, so we did a mathematical calculation. There's a mathematical calculation that's done that's uh, done as required by the state. On a sample set of properties. Uh, on uh, yes, yes. So he took a sample set of properties. He calculated it, the valuation that was done versus the market value, mm -hmm. and we were th we were within tolerances. Yeah. Tolerances. Yes. Were we well within tolerances, or were we? Was this? Yeah. We we met the standard. I'm sorry. Is that a second grade term, Mr. DeWitt? Yeah, exactly. Oh, sorry, we're, we're, we're way off second grade. We're, it's, yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to answer statistical questions for second grade. <laughs> right, right, right. But so we're within the, we're within the margin of error. So yes. Can, okay. And if, if I can, just to frame this, I think you need to look a little bit at real estate history. The last one was done in 93. All right, we do it again, and typically we've been doing them every 10 years. So some of the issues that we ran up against over a 10-year period, it's highly unlikely, though probably not impossible, highly unlikely that property values go down from year one through year 10. Yeah, and, and I get that. And my question was, but, go ahead. But just Sorry. to finish, because we did it every five years, because it was kind of a perfect storm of things, we're doing a reval right after properties went down. So the two-year sampling period for looking for comparables yep. was both a low volume because the yep. number of units was down, and this is based on comps in many cases. So the comparables aren't as frequent, so you're making bigger adjustments just by definition. Agreed. And then second, you've got a market value drop. So now you're trying to figure out how far property values have gone down rather than a big window where they pretty much have gone up. And the only question is, you know, how far up did they go? So it's, it's a much different experience, and certainly that leads to the number of appeals. Uh, and consternation and confusion on behalf of the residents and then sitting in on some of the residential s sessions uh, with residents asking questions of the prior appraisal company when you're trying to explain a partial data collection we're using algorithms and uh, other mathematical formulas to compute or extend out to market values for neighborhoods and homes uh, it gets tough to follow and frankly, as a realtor, it was tough to follow. So it comes back to my question. And the reason, again, I'm for the full valuation. I'm not questioning the need for that. I'm trying to say our citizens are watching this. Mm -hmm. They're saying we're going to have a, a full revaluation now. And all the ills of the world are going to go away, right, And in terms of the valuation of my house. What I'm saying is what is the expectation here? Do we expect what have other towns seen? when they do a full valuation during a partial valuation versus a partial valuation. That's one part, but what I was trying to explain is not everybody has that comparison in a down year. As simple as I could say it before. Right. right. But so I, that, so I it's, grant it's that. harder to measure that. And second, just to clarify, it doesn't mean all the ills go away. I agree. It them. just increases the probability that we'll have uh, each home with their fair share. That might be up or down. That might be the same as this year. That might be different. Right. So there's no guarantee that it's going to change or be that much different than what it is, though it increases the probability that we'll have the background to show clearly to the residents uh, what their fair share is. So we don't know what it's going to do, but we're going to be more comfortable with it because of the work that's been done. Basically. It says nothing. Right. And and by the way, just for the record, we did statistics in third grade where I grew up. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, is, this, is this where we ask what you scored on those tests? <laughs> Low. Mr. Brockville. Yeah, I, I, I feel like we're moving towards a vote. So I wanted yes. to say, and along with you, you and Catherine at least, I don't know about the, the three down there because you haven't said anything, I'm, I'm in favor of the uh, recommendation of the first selectman and the tax assessor to do a full redo. And I guess to partially answer intuitively your question, Tom, I don't think there's any guarantee that we're going to have a happier uh, set of citizens because some number of people will have done the kind of things that Mike referred to, having put additions on their house. On maybe their not, maybe not them directly, but perhaps the prior or owner. Or the prior owner, right? In terms of with your Home Depot, right. do it yourself type of deal, and somebody. So somebody's going to have a house that is going to be visited, and the you know, the shed they put up or something to house the bicycles, which previously wasn't uh, 
made aware to the town is going to be made aware, and they're going to be theoretically upset because they're going to have to pay their fair share for it. But I don't think that's that's a, a, a concern in any way, shape, or form. That's actually a blessing because the the end of the day. <laughs> Unless you're the homeowner. Well, I understand that, but, but, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here, I Stay think, accurate. is not only be accurate, but be relatively accurate. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and not to sound collectivist, but I mean, what we're trying to do here is to find a way to make this fair to everybody in town or as fair as possible. And, you know, it, it, it seems a little crazy intuitively that we're... 1993, by the, you know, Catherine keeps saying 20 years, but the truth is by the time this thing is finished, it'll be almost 25 years, uh, 24 years, right, because this goes through like 2016 or uh, 17 this, or whatever. The so, date of this yeah. will be October 1st, 2015. Right. The tax bill will be the July 1st, 2016 tax bill. Yeah, so, right. I mean, just finishing up an analogy, I'm think, right. I was thinking about as I was sitting here, was that, when, you know, when you buy a new car, right, a brand new car, you don't have to bring it to the emissions place to be checked <coughs> for, for some period of time. I think it's like four years, but don't quote me on that. And then, though, I mean, there's, a, there's an assumption that in the first few years of a brand new car that the emissions thing is working properly. I'm sure somebody's is broken, but statistically it's almost nobody. But at some point, whether it's four, five, six years out, you start getting these cards in the mail saying you have to come in and uh, go to the gas station and get your emissions thing checked because time has passed and things have changed and your car might not be maintained the way it was previously or parts may have worn out, et cetera. So I'm just saying that, you know, the partial is great maybe every five years, but, but 24 years sounds to me like an appropriate time and probably overdue to, to do this in a more thorough fashion. Thank um, you. Anyway. Thank you, Mr. Brockbell. We'll go to Mr. DeWitt and then I want to wrap this up. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I don't know what the word is, disturbed. <laughs> we keep saying accuracy. Everyone filled out that mailer accurately. We have accurate data in every house. We really do. We don't have a person did, walking excuse me. in. Did you say if before that, or were you making a statement? If. Just, okay. I just if everyone know. filled out that, you know, if everyone filled out that mailer, accurately, as I think I did. We have accurate data. Um, I also um, think that the majority of constituents in this town believe that everything was fine the last time. So I think we're catering to a certain group of people. It feels less like st statistics than it does other things. So. I, me, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced. I, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to support the full valuation. I just can't. We, we keep talking about generalities about data when we have data. You know, there's data. <laughs> we collected data last time. We collected a lot of data. And for 900000 almost $900,000, I don't know how much better this data gets, and I don't know if I, my personal opinion is there's going to be more people with appeals this time. Let's, so, Mr. DeWitt, can I respond to the comments please, just real quick? Please. Um, I understand your point on the data. Um, it's a couple things. Number one, I, I don't know that we can make the assumption that all the data is accurate. Number two, I don't know that we can make the assumption that um, new homeowners would have, who filled out that data, might have had all the relevant stats on that data. Number three, the one thing that, that the argument doesn't take into consideration is the fact that, and the first selectman alluded to it, last time the valuation that was done was an unprecedented time in the real estate market with a lot of low transactions, less comparable information, and perhaps less reliable information about the neighborhoods and the geography of where it was. So the hope is that during this period of time, being that you're in, in a somewhat better economic climate, a somewhat more stable real estate climate that you would probably have better comparables and better things to compare it for to related to the neighborhood in the area of the town in which those residents are located which all may lead due to a better and more consistent sample size to a better result regardless of the the data collected on the individual home 
but right. within the where that home is is uh, located relative to the rest of the town and et cetera. Right. That's the way I'm looking at. And if I might uh, kind of reemphasize some of the points. One is that, uh, Mr. DeWitt, you're phenomenal in terms of, of kind of filling that out, but I, I'm not sure that, that uh, that's a majority of the cases, and I don't have the data to say, I'm, you know, to say that, but you are exceptional. That, that I will commit to. Um, the second piece, I think, well, that's I nice think that's a campaign I, slogan I, next time. Oh. <laughs> DeWitt is exceptional. I first selection. I mean, <laughs> by the way, did we tell Am you? Am I against he's our nominee thing? for first selection? <laughs> <I'm not laughs> the, uh, if he's going to fill out every form like that, the, I don't uh, think I'm the only one. Well, <laughs> it, it depends. You read those surveys about how many people uh, accurately state what they owe the IRS. Um, however, um, that's hearsay, and that's that's other. That, the simple, uh, I think, fact from from a couple things is is one. Um, I think we need to restore credibility to the folks. And, and to your point, it, it's probably not a majority. Uh, and again, I don't have the data for that. But I will say that it's a significant segment of the population that had serious concerns in their mind. And I think even if they're not the majority, we owe it to them to restore their faith in terms of our process for how we allocate your fair share of taxes. This is not just about the value of your house, but about how we allocate your taxes among all of us uh, and all the homeowners out there that are paying taxes on that. So that's all. It's not either or, but it's it's a step to do that. And it's 850,000 approximately is is opposed to the, the sorry number. just. But <laughs> you need to compare that to 656,000. You, you need to compare so. that to <laughs> 600,000 or so. So it's not to the partial 600,000. So the question is, you get this much more accuracy and data for three hundred thousand dollars more that was the point I was trying to make there thank you and I mr. Becker I think you had your hand up and I do want to wrap this up thank you mr. DeWitt as well for your comments sure. and consideration do we have an idea um, on the 200 or so people that filed lawsuits what areas in town those were from for the majority of them I mean I represented Southport it seemed like the bulk of them were there but it, it seemed coastal I mean there there I'm gonna say there were a lot from Southport yeah. and the beach area I don't have yeah. a breakout by neighborhood or zip code to tell you exactly and Don I don't know if could, you do we could yeah yeah I mean I, it well, could be provided but, um, but I would agree with the we don't have, it, tonight. We don't have, we don't it, have tonight, it tonight though. okay I, I guess f for me I did represent that district I did I did go through you know a, a lot with constituents during that time frame but at the time, it didn't seem so much to be. Did you? Nope. I'm just. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and it, it just, to me, it seems like a lot of what happened during that time seemed to be how we weighted almost more the land than the houses. Some of what we're talking about tonight um, isn't that end of how people get assessed because it seemed like it was very much. You had a, a down market, then you had kind of where it leveled off and started heading in one area. Obviously, you didn't have a lot of comps to kind of to back that up, but it seemed to be very specific sections of town that were having a problem, which to me seems less like a partial versus full issue and more like a how you're weighting sections of town, and, and, and that, that yeah, can be somewhat sure. objective as well. Um, but that to me, in this process is going to be I think where the spotlight needs to be even more than this full or, or partial I mean I'm just having a tough personally I'm having a tough time going in this full direction um, because that's kind of still lingering as as why I think we had the biggest issue during you know during the last reval um, and not even without the full not that issue in the prior the prior two those numbers didn't pop up um, as significantly um, as the backlash that kind of came. So you have one type, the same type, all of a sudden the same type, and then a problem. Um, you know, we can get into why that happened to have occurred, but it seemed to be not so much the full or partial. I mean, that's that, that's where I'm at. I don't necessarily, it's not so, it's a statement. <laughs> you can take what you want with it, um, but that's why I'm kind of wrestling with, with that. Thank you, Mr. Becker. I'm going to, Mr. Tetra, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that this is not about just the beach area in Southport. This is about getting every property in town to pay their fair share. Not a penny more, but not a penny less. If 
the tax burden shifted to Southport and the beach area. That could be a fair shift, and we'll, we'll theoretically get another shot at that when we do this valuation. Or it could be an unfair shift, but then that means there are other neighborhoods in town paying less than perhaps their fair share is. So I think it's important on both sides of that equation to make sure we go back and, and take a look at that. In terms of the, the land value, you're absolutely right. That's the bulk typically of the, obviously with condos being an exception, uh, of the value of the, the property. However, um, a lot of that is influenced by which sales and how many. And I think we have an opportunity here to go back uh, with a larger collection of data and what I believe are, are larger unit sales to help provide a so more solid foundation for that valuation. Thank you. Mr. Becker, you okay? Yeah, that's, that's fine. This is Alvin, Thanks. and then I'm going to wrap this up. Yeah. As I listen to the conversation, I don't know. I'll ask this to the first selectman as someone who's worked in the real estate market. Um, if we have a full data collection and as a result we were to see, and this is looking into a crystal ball that none of us can do, um, I would anticipate that we might see changes because going back to will physically know if someone has the shed on their property that was never permitted. We'll know rather than looking at the house from the outside and reading the data collection chart that, no, they didn't say on the data collection letter they updated their kitchen and they've just put in a $100,000 new kitchen. Um, but when we get all of that information or we find out that there's a house on a certain street that hasn't had any renovations but we think that because of the address it's worth a lot because its neighbors mm -hmm. seem to be worth a lot and we realize would this information help with this reassessment um, to give in giving a more accurate picture of what properties are worth <coughs> and therefore it having some potentially positive impact on sharing the tax burden townwide in a different way than has been in the last few years. Would this have any chance of helping the real estate market in this town? Would it help people move their houses that are trying to sell their houses? I, I'm, I don't know that there's an answer for that. Um. I'm not sure I'm current enough in the real estate market to provide a credible answer for that. And our real estate the member is in Israel, yeah. so we can't ask I, him. You know, it, it gets back to it's all about relative share and relative value of the tax bill. If everybody's properties go down in value, then the tax bills don't change, but everybody's assessments, if everybody's go up in value, the tax bills don't change, but the assessments are the same. What happened last time is someone up and someone down. Mm -hmm. uh, and that caused a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of angst out there and I don't think the um, presentations by the last appraisal company while they may have been accurate were not easy to understand or easy to follow uh, for most people so that also adds to the frustration because people don't understand the process Great. well thank you uh, it was just a thought and I'm prepared to vote if mr. chairman you're ready to wrap this up I am uh, Seeing no more comments, I'll go to the public. Any comments from the public? Feel free and please identify yourself at the microphone. Right up here by Mr. Ross, please. Or actually, thank you, Mr. Tetra. You can come right over here. Uh, thank you, Carol Way, uh, 324 Villa Avenue. And I'm also RTM from District 5. Um, but my previous two terms on the RTM were from District 10. And I, I really have um, a great deal of concern about speaking to this issue because I think that I've seen things from all sides um, in terms of um, having lived in Brooklawn Park with my first home and in Woodfield Village and then the last 18 years before moving to Villa Avenue um, were on Beach Road. Um, what I did mention to um, Mr. Ross on um, the night of our budget vote um, was, and 
and he said, Carol, I don't like you using the word targeting, and, um, and I understand that completely. But I, I do believe that the main problem that happened with this last um, uh, revaluation was the fact that there was a greater premium put on certain areas. And I know Assessor Ross said to me, well, Carol, it's location, location, location. And I have had a re my real estate license in the past, and I understand what he means by that. But these locations didn't change um, since 1993, or in many cases, way before that. Um, but the way they were valued um, in the revaluation did change, I believe. Um, and that's why we have certain areas of town that went down or stayed level, and we have others that actually doubled in some cases, and even some commercial properties uh, in, in um, the beach area. Um, now, I believe that if we could really and truly um, have a great deal of influence on the company that is chosen to do the revaluation, uh, to really um, impress upon them how important it is to actually have access to the properties, that a full uh, revaluation of um, the homes and um, commercial properties and so on is a very important thing. And I'll give an example, and it goes right to something that um, Mike was saying. My house on Beach Road um, was purchased in 1995. And um, the listing for it did not show anything about the third floor being a finished third floor. Um, and as I was going through it, I said, well, you know, it didn't show this um, on the um, listing for the taxing. And they said, well, you know, we've only been in this property. We were in it for two years um, at the time that they were selling. And um, they were great do-it-yourselfers. And so they had finished off for a home office the third floor of that property on Beach Road. And I said, well, I'm really concerned about this because obviously there was no permit. Um, you did it yourself. Yes, that was the case. Um, so I was concerned about buying the home without that kind of detail. And what ended up happening was I brought in my contractor for my Collingwood Avenue house and had him go through it to see if it was up to code. And I did buy the house in connection with that. Now, Mr. DeWitt, in terms of um, you know, updating things, I updated. They only had three bedrooms listed in connection with my house. When something came through the mail, I did update that it was four bedrooms. I'm finishing up, Tom, I promise, OK? But I do think that it, it does give an ex a very concrete example of the differences in different parts of the town and also the problems um, with no permitting and things of that sort. Um, one other thing, too. I really was very curious about a lot of things. And so I looked on vision appraisal at details about certain homes on Sasco Hill Road, for instance, certain homes in the Pine Creek area, et cetera. And then I went to Old Academy um, in Greenfield Hill, um, Mine Hill Road, um, a number of houses uh, up around the center of Greenfield Hill and so on, and looked at a comparison of the acreage, um, the square footage, different things of that sort. And it was not so surprising to me to see how, how much of a greater um, assessment and valuation had been given for a property that was actually smaller in land and also in square footage to um, on Sasco Hill Road, for instance, um, it was much higher than what 
I saw up in Greenfield Hill. So I really do think that there were problems, and if we could really hold um, their feet to the fire in terms of really trying to get a, you know, get into the homes and really get the details, um, then I, I really think that the full evaluation uh, is a good thing, and it probably should be done anyway if the last one was not done um, uh, since 1993. Thank you. See, I wasn't the only one that filled out the... All right. <laughs> what, Mr. Becker? Just I, bef before the vote on this, there, there's two questions I have. One, is there any, have we clarified that our role as essentially stops at this, or are we going to be getting updates? That's what or the any? opinion of the okay. town attorney is. And we're agreeing and running question. Okay. And then the other one is if at the, n this is now going to, this is a contingency transfer, so it's going to go to a, f a final body, the RTM, It's my understanding. So no, 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 I don't believe so. It stops here. Contingency can stop. It does stop. It does stop here. Okay. Stops. Then that. Okay. Okay. Any other? No. And that's. It, the motion is before us. So the motion before us to here consider and act upon a request, Chief Fiscal Officer, transfer four hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars from contingency to the assessor's fees and professional service accounts in the two thousand and fifteen budget. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions. Item carries. This item's done. I'm going to ask for a short uh, recess, five minute break, and we'll come back and start with item number two on the agenda. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the round two of the uh, no. Board of Finance June meeting. Uh, yeah. Um, where is Mr. Becker? <laughs> okay, so we're calling this back to the table. Uh, let's hope. And the item is uh, to review suspense accounts for the tax collector. Please come on up, Cinda. Welcome. And please walk us through. Hi. Hi. Okay, every year, again, by state statute, Every year, the tax office reviews the accounts uh, that are open, and if a determination by the tax collector is that a account that is still due is uncollectible by several means. Bankruptcy makes it uncollectible. Um, someone who's deceased makes it uncollectible. Certain, prop, uh, certain uh, bills are uncollectible. Um, if we have done our due diligence, if people have moved out of state and we can't find them, we can deem it as uncollectible. We compile a list. It's called the suspense list. It takes those accounts and that amount of money out of your collectible taxes and if that account is found or say someone moves back into the state of Connecticut, we still can collect the money. What we are saying is that we have done our due diligence in our office and that we have not been able to collect that money by all of the tools that we have at our disposal. So this year, it's larger than it has been the last two lists that I have given you. Um, as of January of 2014, we were at full staff in our office. We took advantage of the fact that we had the personnel. We researched accounts because you don't want to just put accounts on, you know, without any kind of a background or at least putting in the effort to try, and you, we use the internet, we use a, a lot of outside tools to try to find things and find people, find companies that have closed. Um, so we were able to research a lot of accounts and to come up with this list that we feel is accurate. I do have to tell you that last week, one account on this list just showed up out of nowhere and paid. Yay is right. 
So we can, we will be able to collect any of these that we can find. Um, so it doesn't mean that we won't ever get the money. It just means that we are trying to give you an accurate reflection of what we believe is collectible. Thank you. Any questions on this list? This is kind of a standard annual event. Um, seeing no questions, I'll go to the public on this. Seeing none, back to the board. Okay. The item, can someone, uh, we need to vote on this, correct? Yes. It doesn't list it as a voting item here in the. I guess I make a motion to accept the recommendations of the task force. Yeah. Can we make a motion to add this as a voting add, item? Um, that we add as a microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll make a motion that we add as a voting item um, to accept the report, the suspense, suspense report from the tax collector uh, as. Uh, before us in, um, we don't have an item number for it, but. Item number, uh, it was item number two, it's now item number four. Item number four of our agenda. Thank you. Do I have a second to that? Mr. DeWitt, all in favor of adding this? Those opposed, abstentions, the item is added as a voting item and now we may vote on the item. I'll move the motion. Do I have a second? Mr. DeWitt again. Uh, any other comments from board members? Anything from the public? Seeing none. All in favor of accepting this list? Opposed? Abstentions? The item carries. I believe is in past practice. I have to sign this, correct? And we'll have myself in. Doesn't the, it's either myself or the secretary of the board, correct? All right. So I'll execute that. Mary, are you okay with that? Okay. I signed the actual list itself. I can sign the list too. Thank you very much. And sorry we made you wait. Thank you. Have a good night. You as well. All right, item number three, which is now item number five. Let me just renumber these. Seven. Okay. Uh, to hear, consider, and act upon a following resolution recommended by the Director of Public Works, resolved that a 2013 $275,000 small town economic assistance program, STEEP grant, being hereby is accepted in order to increase handicapped accessibility in South Bend's Marina, Southport Beach. Yee Yacht Club in Sasco Beach and further resolved first selectman Mike Tetro and hereby is authorized to apply for and execute the grant agreement and funds for this project. Do I have a motion to move this item? Mrs. LeClaire, do I have a second? We'll get Mr. DeWitt. Thank you. The item is before us. Good evening, Mr. Arley. Thank you for waiting. Go right ahead. Sure. Uh, good evening, financiers. <laughs> Uh, I'm uh, Bill Hurley, H-U-R-L-E-Y. Uh, I'm the engineering manager, and I'm here to express Joe Michelangelo's and I, my uh, report, I mean support, for the acceptance of the 2013 STEEP grant. Over the past four to six years, the town of Fairfield has applied for the Small Town Economic Assistant Program to increase handicap accessibility or benefit the community via economic impact. In uh, July 2012, the town's application was filed and approved for the following projects. The South Benson uh, Marina area to increase uh, the accessibility uh, to the Henry Moore Fishing Pier and the South Benson Marina Picnic area. Number two was Southport Beach. Originally, it was to repair and replace the building and to provide access to the restroom. Since then, the town has decided to break this into two parts. Uh, the first to do the access um, and in the fairly near future to replace the restroom building. The sidewalk construction will include a heavy duty access apron with the future construction in mind. Uh, number, item number three was Sasco Beach. The project will include a sidewalk ramp, ADA compliant, 
from the parking area to the newly upgraded AD, A, uh, ADA restrooms. And fourth was the Ye Old Yacht Yard, constructing a new ADA compliant restroom building that, was, uh, that has received historic district approval. There were some original uh, revisions to the uh, original grant uh, in items two and four. Uh, basically, uh, real quickly, is we decided to replace the old yacht yard, and actually it since has been demolished. Uh, and, um, and for item number two, as I said, uh, we'd split that into two phases. Uh, this has been approved by the state and does not alter the resolution in any way. Uh, the amount of the steep grant is for $275,000. The town has solicited contract bids for all four projects. The first three were considered fair bids and were just slightly below the engineer's estimated costs. The fourth bid, the Ye Old Yacht Yard, came in a little higher than expected. The town will rebid this contract, uh, probably certainly within this month, taking out some of the site work that DPW can perform. This will serve as a benefit to the town by lowering the contract costs and by uh, having DPW meet the uh, local match requirement as part of the grant, or $25,000. Joe Michelangelo, the director of DPW, and I are confident that all four projects can be accomplished within the steep grant uh, parameters and support the town in approving this generous steep grant funding. Uh, keep in mind these projects will also help the elderly, families with carriages, numerous walkers, and several beachgoers. The, the town cannot proceed with any construction until the grant contracts are fully executed. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Hurley. Uh, before I turn it over to my colleagues for um, more detailed questions, I have a couple of uh, comments, questions just on the paperwork. Um, in your presentation, you said you applied for the grant on, in July 2012, is that correct? That's correct. Who says government is not efficient when the state of Connecticut issued a document that says this was approved as of January 7, 2012? six months before it was applied for. Um, nice. The question I have is it says January 7th. If it's January, a lot of times, including I'm guilty of it, <laughs> how many times have we wrote in the checkbook the wrong year? I have right. a feeling that's what happened. Uh, Which goes to my next question. It's stamped that it was received uh, January 8th, 2013. So I'm assuming this is January 2013 in the letter is right just and and that's what we refer to it as the 2013 steep grant right um, I I like my government is efficient more um, the other question I have on this letter though is that it does reference and I just want to do this before I turn it over to my colleagues it does reference uh, please confirm your award with OPM within 60 days of the date printed above now, whether that's 2012, 2013, yeah, it's not that. 2014. So how, is, how are we in compliance with that? What are we? Um, I believe the first selectman has, because um, as I said, we recently applied for a revision and they approved it. So I, I think we're good. But uh, I believe he had 60 days to uh, say that um, he uh, approved the uh, award and then that it would have to go through the various town processes. I believe, and I don't know if he's still here, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was, I don't know which board, but one of the town boards uh, wanted to go out to contract before, uh, uh, before they were to approve this grant. So we have, we have done that, as I said. Out well, to bid, non-contract. Out, well, out to bid, yeah, bidding okay. contract, purchasing contract, or purchase bid. And, and so that's what we have done. And that, that process had started, I, I'll say, relatively from uh, the springtime and, and has, has come through and all bids have been opened. But like I said, the one was slightly higher than uh, what we had hoped for. And so we will take out a, a component or two of that and break it down a little bit more so that um, we can fit well within the, uh, the grant. So we have no concern that we've missed a date on this. Uh, who can... Thank you, Mr. Hurley. You weren't a party to the discussions, right, to get this amended and moved forward. In other words, how do we know that it's still in force in 2014? Um, as I said, we, we uh, have been in constant nego um, you know, uh, I just conversations. I just don't see the paperwork here. So oh. is that, oh. Mr. Tetro, did you have that? Or what's the, 
What did I? What am I missing? Yeah, no, I, I believe the any paperwork relating to that would be with DPW, uh, more than our office. But I also think that, uh, you know, Mr. Hurley's confirmed that they've accepted modifications to this. Reconfirm that we still have that's valid. The other point that I would make is uh, between when this was applied for and when it was awarded, yeah. we had that storm Sandy thing. Yeah. And so they knocked been, us back to the prior year. Well, actually, it, it helped with a couple of items here that we didn't quite have to demolish them. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we were pre-demolished. <laughs> okay. So that's, uh, some quick thinking on DPW. They went back and modified the approach that we're going to eliminate the, the dem demolishing step. Uh, but I think the state has been very flexible in some of these in terms of the timing and that type of thing because of that, too. So, so um, I, and just in all seriousness, so we have no concern that this is off the table or that we can't move forward on this despite the fact that it speaks to 60 days and we see no documents before us that say that's officially been extended. Correct. If there have been a number of steep grants in the past yeah. where we actually um, have tweaked them, swapped out projects, and had some extended delays based on our working them into our schedule and the approval process and doing that, the most recent example uh, would be the canopy on the uh, stairs leading up uh, to the, by the downtown railroad station. Uh, that went through a couple different iterations in terms of what the project would be, and it took us a while to get um, all the approvals we needed, including from DOT, to, in order to affect the canopy and some other things that were some of the bricklaying that was part of that project. Thank you. So with that and with the discussion of the dates, from my view, over, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Mr. DeWitt, did you have your hand up? Just real quick. Um, so, Mr. Hurley, you kept saying 275. The, the uh, page three shows the total project cost at 300000 with a $25,000 local applicant funds. Is that going to go away now? Because I thought your comment was we, will, we <coughs> could fit it all within the 275. Um. <clears throat> Or are we still putting in twenty five thousand local? Well, funds? It's, it's an in kind match. Yeah, but we we can. Oh, yeah, okay. they they allow on that. They do allow, and that's actually ironically, uh, the one bid was one seventy seven, and the other ones were one twenty five. So we we hit pretty we hit pretty close to where we wanted. But uh, the twenty five thousand, rather than having it come say out of pocket, they do allow in kind services. Oh, got it. Okay, and so uh, we. Um, the director, DPW director Joe and I um, decided that we would have uh, DPW do uh, some of the site work. For instance, like a sanitary sewer connection. Sure, sure. Relatively easy when you have the machine there. We don't really have to pay for mobilization, so to speak. And, and we can do that work and, quote, save the town 20000 from the contract. Got it. And so, therefore, that would be the, one of the things that it would be a couple days' worth of work, and yet. Uh, we would chop that number down so that we would we would meet the parameters of the grant. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions on these items, Mrs. Leclerc? Could I just clarify? So we're going to do two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars worth of work on top of the top of if the grants for two seventy-five, or or the grant or that's the combined total. <clears throat> No, the, if if we spend two seventy five, they will reimburse us two seventy five. We okay. would just have to show that we did twenty five thousand additional, as in kind service. Okay, so, it's so just we just have to keep all the receipts right. and the paperwork. But yes, okay. when you said match, I didn't know if it was dollar for dollar. Okay, um, and then a second question is: I keep getting questions on um, at um, the old yacht yard. Um, the storm took away the little building where the boaters kept their oars. Will that be part of the project um, when you do the bathrooms? I believe there is a storage unit, you know, a storage area in with the restrooms, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Uh, we had the, our, our quote, architect in our uh, in-house uh, uh, do that work. And if... I can try to look it up real quick if you have a minute. If not, I'll certainly get back to you on that. Okay. okay. And if you could, while you're checking that, I also got a similar question as to whether something could be put up temporarily until we get this complete project done. So when you're taking a look, could you also take a look at whether there's an option for temporary? Because I think some of the people that need the oars need it sooner rather than later, right? Because that's an ongoing well, problem, not just Well, it's the second a summer that they have no place to store them. Right. So 
Uh, so perhaps we can get a temporary structure in there or waiting for the permanent structure to help alleviate the uh, ore problem. Yeah, and uh, for that one, I would I would check with the DPW director. Um, if it's a temporary structure, we would have to just hopefully do through a, a via a phone call with the historic district that they would allow something temporary. Right. Uh, in the past, I believe they have, and and we would probably just have some agreement that it would only be for like the summer season or something like that. You know, sometimes okay. things that are temporary. There's a there now, so I guess. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Mr. Becker? Just some, some of the items, are, are they in any way, they weren't insurance type items now post the storm? Because I mean some of these like down at the beach, some of the buildings and stuff, so they were not insurance related D DPW items. DPW so. went through and looked, but what you're talking about are new capability, improved ADA access. So there are things that weren't there before. There are cer certainly some repairs along these lines, and DPW has done a good job of trying to match repairs with the projects. But for the most part, no. So there there, like there were new capabilities. Storm, uh, you know, one of the big delays from our part certainly was the fact that Storm Sandy tied up DPW so much we couldn't get to these projects. Now we're finally getting back to them. There have been a number of cit citizens asking about the status of these. And it's purely due to the amount of work that Storm Sandy generated. We're finally now getting back to these. And then, like the bathrooms, they survived. So if we want to upgrade them now, use this funding. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll go to the public on this item. Nothing on this item. I'll bring it back to the board for a vote. Uh, here, consider and act upon the following resolution recommended by the Depart Director of Public Works. Resolved that a 2013 $275,000 small town economic assistance program steep grant be and hereby is accepted in order to increase handicap accessibility at South Benson Marina, Southport Beach, E Yacht Yard, and Sasco Beach. And further resolved that First Selectman Michael Tetro be and hereby is authorized to apply for and execute the grant agreement and accept the funds for this project. All in favor of this item? Opposed? Abstentions. The item carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Hurley. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Good luck with the project and have a good night. Thank you. All right. Um, item number seven. Wait. No. Sorry. Item number six. To hear, consider, and act upon a request from the Chief Fiscal Officer. Transfer $25,000 from the IT contingency account to the IT special department supplies account in the 2014 fiscal year budget which means the year that ends next this month good evening mr. Leslie thank you for your patience no problem Don Leslie director of IT hey <clears throat> yes the budget that ends <clears throat> this month so this is the GIS system which I seem to recall from our budget discussions correct Right. And the reason this happened was that uh, I, I could have survived up until the point of the RTM pulling the last, uh, the last cutout, the $30,000, and that basically put a squash on this. And I, I feel this is very important and, and it's very needed. Uh, did you want me to sort of go through the whole document or did you just want to ask? Give us the Reader's Digest version since we read <coughs> the document. And then if anyone has any questions, they can uh, go okay. from there. Uh, the, the history of it is the fact that the GIS system, we, we, we've been in a holding pattern for the last number of years with the GIS system because Bridgeport came across, or the Greater Bridgeport Regional Council developed a group, a GIS group, and they were doing a regional GIS, and the question was how, how would we play with them and work together with them in a nice way? Would we re really need GIS or not? Uh, the answer to that is yes, we do need GIS in the town because the regional the Greater Bridgeport Regional System is not uh, going to do it all. They're, they're, they're working on a regional basis, not on a town basis. And there's a lot of data in the GIS system that we have now that's out of date that is very beneficial to the town and the fire departments and the different departments. Uh, we, we need uh, the upgrade to the software to run on the new Windows operating system, so we're holding up people from being upgraded their PCs, and it's also a security issue because Windows XP is not being uh, supported anymore. And uh, 
We are currently not able to exchange data with the state because they're in the new system and we're not. Uh, who, who is the state? No, who, who developed the system that we're using? It, it was developed internally by uh, one of my people and one of the engineering uh, staff people. So they didn't use an outside contractor to develop the GIS system? Right, no, they didn't. Okay. <clears throat> um, and uh, it'll enhance productivity in it'll enhance pr productivity and eliminate inefficiencies that we have with the current system. Right now, with the old system, if we want to share any data with the state or DPW or any of those bodies, we've got to go through a conversion process because we're running old data. And it, in the simplest terms, it's you know XY coordinate system. We're we're running on an old XY coordinate system in our GIS, and we we need to move up to the new system, the new coordinate system. And then that way we'll be able to electronically share data and not do a big conversion with uh, other state agencies. Uh, Mr. Leslie, one question. This talks about updating licenses. This, this, this money is going to buy GIS licenses for the workstations, and then that'll let us rebuild our database and upgrade the, do the conversion from the old system to the new who, system. Who are we buying licenses from? ESRI is the name of the company. Uh, I don't know what it stands for. It's like an environmental systems resource or something. It doesn't really match what they did. But. Yes, sir. And the software is called ArcGIS. <coughs> and they're the... Uh, so it's not a home th They're the system. Microsoft of this. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar thing. with them. Yeah. No. Uh, sorry, you were going to say? No, but you're licensing software from them, and in that software, you put our information, our data, right for yeah, the town. Yeah. yeah. In the way to think about GIS is, you take a map, you take a database, you squish the two of them together. Yeah. The other way to look at it is, you got a uh, a map of Connecticut, and you go to the Monopoly game, and you start putting pieces on it, like fire hydrants and telephone poles and theaters and gyms and stuff. And that's basically what a GIS system, it lets you track stuff from a graphical perspective. Like. And the uh, Greater Bridgeport uh, Regional is going to continue to license the same software on a regional basis? Or they're developing their own independent of this? No, they're, they're, they're using the same stuff. And if, you, if you saw the picture, yep. basically what's going to happen is we'll, we'll be using their stuff. It's saving us the cost of an administrator. It's saving us the cost of a map server. Yep. And we'll be feeding their system with our information. And we'll be able to put our information up in, our, in their system so that we can actually show it to the residents and they can see stuff. Or uh, as an example, in a, in a Storm Sandy or Irene, we can use it and dynamically update it so that uh, working crews out in the field, if they have a tablet, they could actually see where their next, you know, the next closest thing to fix is, like a down tree or whatever, or power lines. Right. So this will allow you to to work into with the Greater Bridgeport Regional Authority yes. and use their system. Yes. Yeah, I got it. Leverage their system and leverage our system. Okay. Any questions on this? Um, quick question. Since we were looking at our charter t earlier tonight, um, part of that revaluation system we approved, it's, it says that we can update our tax maps and land maps through that. Uh, is there a plan to do that as part of it, and will it be entered into the system? They, they all work together. Our, our vision system works with the ESR GIS okay. system. So we, the we, we put out the information up to their site, and so that's... It, it, it's a compatible system. Okay, so the updated data will go into it. Right. Okay, great. And, and one of the reasons w we want the GIS system is so that we can update frequently. And one of the, one of the issues with G GBRC is the fact that they've only got a staff of three at this point actually doing this work for six towns. So there, there's a lot of work for them to do, and a couple of towns haven't had any GIS at all, Easton and Monroe, and so they're trying to bring them up to speed. So. Great. Okay, thank Any you. other questions? Mr. Backer? So is there any adjustment in the ongoing costs <coughs> once this is done? Uh, like uh, licenses, more of them, the, higher they'll, rates? They'll, they'll be a like main, that. I mean, ap once I buy them now, I'll have a year's maintenance, mm -hmm. and then there'll be a maintenance fee on it afterwards. So after that, there'll be something. Okay. Yeah. And then right now, 
um, the setup that we have, it, the data is hosted ultimately on our servers. It's, a, in our, it's, it's on our old servers yeah. at this point in time, yes. And the data will post this. I see, you know, Amazon Cloud with, with them. Are we talking about shifting our data over to them in a hosted environment, or was it ultimately still going to reside? Both. Both. And, and one nice thing about having the cloud is it sort of gives us an automatic backup. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about the cloud is there might be some stuff that we don't want on there. I mean, not so much that we don't want on there, but that, that we want to keep public or private. You know, like, uh, you know, you don't want to tell terrorists where all your sewer lines are. But we'd be, we'd be able to have a login spot for people that need to get to that data versus the public just being able to see, you know, where things are in town or something like that or look at their lot or that type of thing. So, so we've got security there. And so the data is going to reside in both spots because we also feed the data into the police and the fire department from our systems. When they're on the road and they're going to a fire, they can sit there and look it up and say, hey, there's hazardous materials there and this is where the uh, uh, water outlet is for the fire hoses and stuff like that. Well, that was where sort of where I was headed with the cloud question is one of the problems that I guess has been that on the fire side to load it onto the laptops, some of that data is pretty substantial in its size. Yes, so, it is. so this is going to trend in a cloud direction, hopefully to be able to pull. We are going to run both systems because the internet is never guaranteed. And if you're in a Storm Sandy or an Irene when all the cell phone towers get lit up like Christmas trees and everything else like that, the police and fire are always going to have a standalone system. It might not be you know, might not have a hundred percent of the data, but it's certainly going to have like ninety percent of the data. Portion. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Um, before we go any further, I am going to abstain from this vote. Uh, I, upon reading this item this afternoon, a company that I just recently joined is involved in the efforts with the Greater Bridgeport Regional Commission on their mapping software and providing environmental information to them. And to the extent that this may uh, interact or facilitate the town interacting with that system, I don't think it'd be appropriate for me to vote on it. And so I will abstain. Uh, and no one should read into that. Uh, well, we do have a quorum. quorum right. Oh, you're just voting as an abstain. I'm just I'm voting in as abstain. Yeah. So if there's no more comments, we go to the public for any comments. Mr. Hurley, you have anything to say? <laughs> he, he, he's my backup in case you did. All right. All right. Seeing none. Um, this item is before us. So, to hear, consider, and act upon a request from the chief fiscal officer to transfer twenty-five thousand dollars from the account IT contingency to the IT special department supplies in the two thousand in the fiscal year two thousand and fourteen budget. All in favor of this request? Oh, second. did I? Did we not do that? My apologies. Someone move that, please. Mrs. LeClaire, second by Mr. DeWitt. All in favor of this item? Opposed? And the abstention would be me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leslie. Um, next item, last item. Uh, to hear, consider, and act upon a request from the Chief Fiscal Officer to transfer $1,120,790 from contingency to various accounts per the attached Schedule A in fiscal year 2014. Do I have a motion? Ms. Zalman, do I have a second? Mrs. LeClaire, this item is now before us. Discussion, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the uh, prior to, or let me rephrase that, subsequent to the approval of last year's budget, uh, DPW, police, and PETA uh, uh, all came to agreement with, with their labor contracts with the town. In addition, the uh, department heads uh, received the raises through the first uh, Board of Selectmen uh, process. Uh, because this all happened after the budget process, the, uh, the anticipation and the estimate for those uh, salary and wage adjustments was concluded was included in the contingency account. What this transfer by department uh, action does is to transfer from contingency to the department the difference between 
uh, what they what was in the budget and what was actually paid and is being paid uh, as a result of the union contract uh, that was uh, that was agreed to. Okay, so this is tracks. So the result of this transfer is because, or the reason for this transfer, not the result of this transfer. The reason for the transfer is last year we approved a budget, as we have for several years, um, where contracts were not finalized. So the exact salary information, compensation information was not owned. So we did a blanket approval um, within the contingency account to set aside monies to, to fund right what we assumed these contracts might look like along with a variety of other things correct subsequent to the approval of the budget those contracts were finalized ratified and now we are move, simply moving the funds from the contingency account to the appropriate salary lines to appropriately fund the budget or the contracts that were approved at the end of the road by the RTM correct um, this is the item that moving forward we requested that we don't wait until this late date in the year but as soon as practical after the contracts are settled we do those adjustments these transfers at that point so we'll have better financial reporting better is a harsh word better against budget financial reporting uh, during the course of the year I think better is an excellent word correct okay um, so that's why we are where we are today correct okay thank you um, mr. DeWitt you've been patient thank you in um, the quick question and in 24 fiscal year 2014 contingency there are still funds for departments that are not reconciled yet correct correct okay and we won't talk about that numbers and there's also funds set aside presumably for anything else that comes up between now and the end of the year that if not utilized will go towards the surplus correct yeah you're, you're half a storm <laughs> yes he got three weeks mr. <laughs> mr. mayor's half a storm yes this is correct what other questions do board members have on this item can, um, question that I have um, procedurally can you tell me what process was gone through to calculate these numbers we're out it obviously not going to audit each of these numbers but I'd just like to get comfortable as to how they were actually yeah. calculated it's basically a, a, a real grassroots ground up per employee number uh, initially developed by the uh, HR department and then uh, reviewed and looked at by uh, by Linda and, and compiled by Linda Gardner and looked at a little bit by myself is the payroll department involved at all are, are spot checking any of these numbers the, um, the payroll department could because we're look, comparing the fiscal 10 in most cases to really the 13 except for DPWs at the 14 spot checked some and when they actually got their retro payment they were they spot checked some of those too to make sure that the retros were correct okay and then that was then embedded into this right so some of these obviously because they're settled they're already um, in actual results yes right they've been paid out yes. they're in the actual results and now what we're actually doing is truing up the budget to those actual results correct and in that regard we have 11 months worth of actuals already in to compare to correct actuals people are getting paid right depending on either for their 14 salary or 13 depending on their union yes right. and actuals are through 11 accurately months. corrected done because the retro payment and then as of that date we would then change their salary and payroll going forward right so you couldn't solely use the retro payment clearly because that exactly. was as of a certain date but that plus the change in salary gets you to these numbers right so that has been reviewed by it was originally calculated by human resources it's been reviewed by payroll on a spot basis it's been reviewed by the budget director and we're 11 months through the year so now we're dealing with one month worth right this is a budget transfer only yes. actuals are actuals people clearly yep. have been getting yet so there's there's two pieces to this which is always the confusion and it, it's kind of complicated but yes the there's a retro piece that's for prior years 
and then there's a retro piece and the actual piece that's for this year. But then there's this budget piece. That's all of it. Which is the other side of it, because some is at a 10, some is at 11. Now we're getting everybody up to at least 13, depending on which contract they're in, and yeah. DPW and, and department heads are at 14. Got it. So it gets everybody the cur budget current, but only for, there's a certain contracts that are only settled through 13. Exactly. That's only included in these numbers. Thank you for the clarification. Do people understand that? Any questions on that? Any concerns on this item? The holiday pay, the overtime pay, all of that is based on what's contractually obligated for us to provide, correct, since this is a budget transfer. So we're not just trying to bury any differentials between budget and actual by transferring an amount here. This is based on the contracts. And this is budget only. This is budget only. I, I, no, I get no that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it budget only? <laughs> no general fund impact. Right. Any comments on this? Any questions, Mrs. Alvin? Mrs. LeClaire, are you set? Wait, wait, wait. When you said it's for 13, but this is through fiscal 14, so we're still one year behind? On some contracts, some on, okay. but there's some that have settled through 14. Okay. So they are completely up to date, but the contracts that expire June of 13, we still are leaving that, that year. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, seeing no members of the public, we'll come back. <laughs> we bored them to death. Um, Jerry and, from. and we're such a fun crowd, too. Um, any, any more questions of the board? Seeing none, I'll put the item before us. All right, to a vote. Uh, to hear, consider, and act upon a request from the Chief Fiscal Officer to transfer $1,120,790 from the contingency account to various accounts per the attached Schedule A, which is by department, by type of salary and compensation line, in the fiscal year 2014 budget. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Um, that's it. We have item number eight, to hear, consider, and act upon any other communication. There is no other communication that I'm aware of. Caitlin, did we get anything that you're aware of? Okay, the one item I do have, though, that I just want to uh, point out is that um, when is our, can we just briefly, what's our July schedule, just so that we can remind everybody. Do you remember? It's a beautiful thing. There's no meetings in July. That's right. There's no meetings yes. in July. So we're off until August. Yep. And then what are our meeting dates in August? We have an early August meeting? That's it. Yes. One early August, and then we have three in September. Right, because we have the quarterly in September. Quarterly, right? capital, quarterly, and the regular. Yeah. Right. The yearly review. Right? Thank you. That's what I thought. Um, I thought that was right on July. I wasn't sure about August vis-a-vis -vis the quarterly. One item on the quarterly. Um, we just finished the budget process, and as in our history, as is our history and our custom, um, the subcommittee, the budget subcommittee, should be getting together over the next few months to review the good, the bad, and the ugly um, from the budget process to make recommendations. Um, on how we could continually improve it each year. This is what we call our post-mortem post review. Um, I would ask that the budget subcommittee um, start planning those meetings. I would also ask that any members that have any suggestions on how to improve the budget uh, uh, process, submit those uh, suggestions to myself, to Caitlin, uh, and to Jim Brown, who is also a member of the budget committee. No. Yeah, he is. Jim is. We'll get him to the budget committee, and you guys will go forward from there. As vice chairman, he's on there. Um, oh, we'll, wow, really? Yeah. So we'll <laughs> go to the budget committee. No. <laughs> so we'll go. So we'll go to the budget committee, and then I'll ask that the budget committee come back with their thoughts and recommendations she at our quad. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll nominate him for everything. He's no, not here. And then, and then what we'll do is. Um, We'll have an open board discussion about that and how we can improve, improve the process at our quarterly meeting. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. So, uh, our quarterly meeting in September. September, because we moved it late to allow them to get the fiscal year closed later. Yep, yep, yep. So I appreciate that clarification. I wish everybody that we don't see a happy uh, July and some uh, well-deserved time off. And with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Mrs. Alvin. Seconded by Mr. DeWitt. All in favor? All opposed? Good night, everybody.